Well, hello everyone. Very warm welcome back to The Doctor Will See You Now, bringing you interviews and conversations with authors from around the world. Uh, they may be authors that you haven't read before, so you find a new, a new book to, to just delve into. Or you may have a chance to come and listen to an author whose work you so enjoy uh, and that just a chance to sit down with them and we have a, a relaxed chat. For me, our conversation today, well, it began uh, at Iceland Noir in 2022. I was fortunate and blessed uh, to have our guest on a panel there. And we felt such connection and it was such a lovely conversation that this author kindly agreed uh, to go further. So it gives me great pleasure, tremendous pleasure, Jean, to welcome you into the consultation room. Thank you for being here. Thank you for taking time out to be with us. How are you on this on this wet? I, I, is it wet and, and drizzly where you are? Because it sure is here in the UK. <laughs> Not Jackie. I am so happy to see you again. You have brought sunshine into this rainy day in the Netherlands. Uh, I am American, but I live in the Netherlands. And um, I remember so well meeting you at Iceland Noir. And it was just such a fantastic experience to get to talk with you. And you led our panel so expertly. So I am thrilled to be here. Thank you. We are we are fortunate. We're blessed to have you. And I feel a little bit guilty to be able to concentrate the conversation just with you, because I know when we're on a panel and that importance of bringing in every author, but these one to ones, I think they're so special because, you know, we can just focus. So anybody who's not familiar with Jean, can I just say, if you're not, um, you have a selection of books that are so beautifully written they're not just cracking stories but the use of language and the way that the story goes so i know i keep bringing you authors that i think you should be getting to know but seriously delve into jean's work you won't regret it so jean kwok is an award-winning new york times and international best-selling chinese american author of the novels girl in translation man boy in chinatown and jean's got a lovely array there of the books thank you for the publicity it's great because I, I couldn't do that so that's lovely and searching for sylvie uh and I, I i read and i thought that was wonderful that searching for, for sylvie lee um it had been uh on the today show that 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 u.s morning show um in the jenna the jenna bush book club so wonderful i mean great and there's something else i want to ask you about when we talk about your books now uh, being part of the curriculum in lots of different uh, institutions. Is that one of your kitties that's made a, an appearance there? Yeah. I, I've got kitties walking all around behind me here. So yes, absolutely. Great, if they, if they join us, they are so welcome. Um, but we are here to talk about your latest book. It's due out, I know, in, in the UK in November, the beginning of November, and it's published by Viper. Um, and the title in itself is just stunning. Uh, and there it is behind you, The Leftover Woman. What an amazing title even to start with. Um, I wonder, should we should we begin even on the front cover and say, did did the title, did that was all was that always there in your in your mind as you wrote the book? Or did it emerge once things were really settled in? This was a book where the title was a gift. And I had the title from the very beginning when I started writing this book. Um, that's not always the case, Jackie. You know, I can tell you there have been times when I had some kind of working title, like, you know, dance book or ballroom book or something like my second book. And we are, you know, the book is done, the manuscript is done. They are ready to launch it inside the publishing house. And we do not have a title. Oh. And, you know, the, the editor starts to get more and more stressed. And it's like, you know, yeah. we're all trying to think, but of course, it's my main job and I'm sending these titles that sound like you know Chinese restaurants like the Jade Pavilion they're like no no I don't, no, yeah, I don't so, want that. no 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 go 
God, no. Um, and, you know, and it's like we're ticking and the editor say, you know, Gene, we really need a title because you cannot launch a book without the title, even if you might still need to make revisions or that's not as essential sure. as yeah. having the definitive title because once you imprint that into people's heads you can't be like oh that book that yeah. you thought was called x is now called y it yeah. causes massive trouble and confusion so i i have gone down to the wire but with the leftover women thank goodness that title i had from the very beginning you know what also happens jackie is sometimes you love a title and nobody else does so yeah. you know yeah. that that you know you think you've got the title as the author and then suddenly you are in the last thing sometimes you can even go through the publishing house but then some major person in sales or marketing in the real world yeah. says yeah. no 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 absolutely not and sometimes you need to reconsider so with this one that you said it was a gift when you presented that title to the publishers were they were they did they say yes that is just that is the kind of title we need were they yes. happy they did. Actually, everybody loved the title from the beginning. Um, so that's, you know, that's wonderful. The title and the cover, actually. So, you know, when I first saw the cover, I thought, wow. <laughs> I mean, I thought it was very stunning and gorgeous, but you still, you still need, you have a moment of, whoa, you know, this book that you have dreamed of, is this the right cover? But oh my gosh, it has just, people love the cover so much. So I'm very thankful for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, and, and that sense of um, a, a book's cover that when that book becomes part of our lives, you know, it, it, it habits our, our, you know, I don't know, our coffee tables, our bookcases, and it's just, yeah, when it's a special thing like that. Anyway, enough of the aesthetics. I get very excited about this, but we should delve between the covers because this is where we're headed. Uh, you present us with the story of two women, and I love what you do is they are very different women in so many ways, but then again, they have many things in common. So I wonder if you wouldn't mind for our our viewers and our listeners, could you introduce us to Jasmine and Rebecca uh, and just give us a, a little bit of detail around them um, as and, and what they meant to you and mean to you as characters? Oh, absolutely. I mean, of course, The Leftover Women is the story of what happens when a young woman in China, Jasmine, gives birth to a baby and is told shortly afterwards that her baby had died. And of course she mourns, she's so grief stricken, but a few years later she finds out that her daughter had not died, but had been given away by her own husband to a wealthy American couple in New York City for adoption, another casualty of China's one child policy. And so when the book opens, Jasmine has followed her daughter to New York City to try to get her back. And the story is told in two points of view, from Jasmine Yang's point of view, the biological mother, and from Rebecca Whitney's point of view, the adoptive mother. And Rebecca is wealthy, powerful, successful, um, you know, she's like so many of us trying so hard to juggle all the aspects of a woman's life yeah. of, you know, doing what she loves to do. She's an editor, editorial director at a publishing house. And, you know, she loves her career. She loves books and literature, but she's also, you know, a wife and a mom. And she's trying so hard to keep all those balls in the air. And Rebe Rebecca, although she is flawed, just as Jasmine Yang is, Rebecca loves her adopted Chinese daughter with all of her heart. Um, and so both of these women are very near and dear to me. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I, I, I love the way you describe them. There is clearly, you know, a fondness, a love for the characters that you've created, that they're not just concepts on a page, but these women's lives. You, you've you lived them, you know, with them, and you've gone through this thing. And, and I think in the, in the text, that, that ball of emotion 
that that radiates around each woman and i say that in a very the power of ero emotion not in a negative way but that force that emotional force that is around each woman is, is it's magical to sense it as you read you know it really is i love hearing that jackie because i do love both women um equally and you know i find so much of myself in both of them i mean of course jasmine is chinese and rebecca is white but you know i find so much of myself in jasmine because i was raised also in quite a conservative old-fashioned chinese family where women were meant to be seen and not heard and um, so I really identify with Jasmine and her struggles, but I also identify with Rebecca because, well, obviously I'm in publishing and <laughs> it's kind of an insider's look at publishing yeah. since that's her life. And Rebecca has this perfect life um, that completely starts to crumble <laughs> over the course of the book. Poor Rebecca. Um, and, you know, I identify so much with her struggles too, just simply as a woman. I think in a lot of ways, the book is about women and how we mm. are seen and mm. how that's different from how, mm. how we really are. Yeah, yeah, very, very much so. And I think, you know, the, the oppression that, that 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 the collective of 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 women suffers regardless of where you find yourself in society regardless of your origins uh, regardless of which geographical location but this this class of woman uh, you know is subject to and I'm not saying the class of men doesn't undergo oppression but th but it's what you're exploring in your book here around women's experiences um if we could come to one of those points that notion of motherhood and whether it be biological or or whether it be you know that you've adopted a child um what for you are, are the most important aspects of conveying you know the construct of motherhood well you know what i love about the leftover women is that it's an impossible situation right and our tagline is two mothers two worlds one impossible choice because there is one child fiona or fifi fifi yeah and yes and fifi is just stuck in the middle and she's gotta go with one of the moms um and i know that there are people who have adopted chinese daughters who have even said to me they said is your book going to break my heart like can i read it i said you can absolutely read it because mm. it's not going to break your heart in that i'm not going to come down and say oh the child absolutely belongs with the biological mother or the child absolutely belongs with the adoptive mother i think every single situation is different and has its own pluses and minuses. I think in the end, um, what I wanted to express about motherhood in this book, being a mother myself, is that, you know, we are, we may have differences, we may make big mistakes, um, we may do so many things wrong. But in the end, you know, for both Rebecca and Jasmine, the primary thing is that they love their daughter more than mm. anything else in the world. And they are willing to sacrifice everything, including their own happiness, maybe even their own lives, to keep that child safe and happy. And it's about what unites us, not about what divides us. Yes, definitely. I thought that was one of the strongest messages of the book. You know, we may have differences, all that they can stack up, but together, what brings us together and what can make the difference. Um, you mentioned China's one child policy. Mm -hmm. Um, and and again, that idea of of including a politically sensitive aspect into the book was there at any point that you thought, <laughs> oh, I'm not sure, I'm not sure if I should include this or how to do it, or or are those convictions that you hold was there no question that I need to talk about this? It seemed clear to me that this was an issue that needed to be addressed um, in the media and in art. And I know there's, of course, it has been in the media, it has been covered, but the one child policy has actually not really been written about in fiction. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, there, I mean, I'm, I'm sure there have been books, but 
it's there have been nonfiction books about it, but there have not really there's nothing it hasn't been used as a setting in fiction um, very much, not that I'm aware of. And this is something that I know as a very poor working class uh, immigrant myself. You know, I moved from Hong Kong to the U.S. when I was five, as you know, Jackie, and I lived in an apartment that was so run down, we didn't even have a working central heating system. And so, it, you know, I lived for most of my childhood without heat in New York City, which can be extremely I was going to say those winters are... <laughs> Bitter, bitterly yeah. cold. You know, there was ice on the inside of our windows uh, all winter long. And I also worked, you know, in a clothing factory from like when I was five years old. So, you know, that is the life that I come from. And that is, of course, you know, a part of what fuels the character of Jackie from, uh, I'm sorry, of Jasmine for me. So talking to us about you know that that childhood that was you know it had so many challenges but it strikes me that your parents I, I think they made a wise decision although a very difficult decision um because of that you know I mean they sensed that political change that was that was you know was on the way um your life since then and all that you've experienced into your writing do you always want to ensure that you bring those different experiences of the challenges but also the other side to it? I'm, I'm thinking you know is it for example you know Rebecca and that she's there you know in that publishing industry and the success that you've had with your you know with your amazing writing are you? Do you like to blend that thing of yes, life has challenges, but there's also, you know, really positive aspects to it? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think that's one of the beautiful things about writing. You know, for those of us who are professional authors, but also for anyone who keeps a journal or wants to just jot down their thoughts in any way, it's the beauty of art, right? It's that sometimes sometimes things happen in life that are horribly unfair. Mm -hmm. There are things mm -hmm. that happen that are tragic and meaningless, and you think, why like why does you know why did the nicest person i know die of cancer yeah, for example yeah, right yeah. i mean there are just so many instances of things like that and i feel like writing um or art in general is just one of the ways that we can transfer that type of experience into the field of meaning where i feel like if you shine a light upon something however ugly and difficult it might be becomes beautiful in its own way because you're saying look at this this is what it meant to me this is what it meant to someone else and you know somebody can feel connected to mm -hmm. that um so my work is always grounded in a kind of beating heart that's connected to my own life and Mm. I was just I was just thinking in my previous answer, Jackie, I didn't explain what the one child policy is. Oh, thank you. Know, you the, thank you. Yeah. For those who may not know, the one child policy was when the Chinese government decided that, you know, families were not allowed to have more than one child because population was booming at such a rate that they felt like economically the country couldn't survive if it kept, you know, growing at this rate. Um, you know, I am one of, I'm the youngest of seven children. So it is in Chinese culture to have big families that can help around, you know, help the parents, help around the farm. That is the tradition. But what they didn't count on is that when people were forced to have only one child many many people wanted a son and because they yeah. were allowed only one you know if you had a second one I mean women were really forcibly sterilized abortions were forced you know there were incredible fines of like a year's salary people were fired and ostracized so it was not a, like it wasn't like oh you just have to pay some small amount of money it was like an mm -hmm. impossible thing basically um what happened was that suddenly the gender ratio in china became extremely skewed and I think today there are something like 32 million more men than women in China. 
as everybody thought, not everybody, but many people thought I need, if I'm going to have one kid needs to be a boy to carry on the family name. It's just in the Chinese tradition to take care of us when we're old, yeah. since there's yeah, yeah. no real retirement system in place by the government, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so, you know, the birth ratio started skewing. Now, what was happening? Abortion, of course, they tried to control them to outlaw, outlaw, you know, figuring out what gender the baby was before it was born. Infanticide, um, placing girls for adoption, you know, I mean, really a lot of things happened. They must have, or you wouldn't have 32 million more exactly. men. Exactly, that imbalance. Yeah. yeah, That didn't yeah. come from nowhere. Um, so what, you know, so what happens is that, you know, I did a lot of research around this topic when I was um, writing the book, because even though I was not a victim, we had already left uh, China, I was, I am a first generation immigrant and yeah. I was connected to so many people whose lives were devastated by this. But living in the West, I was also connected to so many people whose lives had been enriched by being able to adopt a child from China. So yeah. I really saw this issue from both sides. But to get back to your current question, Jackie, indeed, I feel like um, my work comes alive when it's connected to something in my own life that I feel very passionate about. Yeah. And and again, as I say, you can you can feel that through through the writing. If we just turn to Rebecca and Rebecca, you know, the uh, the publishing exec, um, I wonder again, were there aspects that you began to develop of this character and then you thought maybe I shouldn't include those because it's a little bit too close to home. People might recognize themselves. Uh, or, or were you able to write her freely? And what's, what's, the, what's, the, what's the thing that you most love about this character? Well, so um, that's actually, that's such an excellent question. And the thing is, I had so much fun writing Rebecca's story because, of course, she's in the publishing world, privy to all of this gossip and scandal that's inside the world. It's such a competitive, strange world with its own rules that are all unspoken, but yet somehow you're supposed to know and follow them. Um, and, you know, so, and your reputation is everything, yes, yes, right? Yeah, everything. Yeah. You cannot break your word. If you do, no one will do business with you from then on. Yeah. And so that part of it was a huge amount of fun to write. But I love your question about did it cut too close to home? Mm. Because um, when I originally wrote it, I actually used the names of real publishing houses um, in the book. Whoa. And yeah, I, I changed it. I did yeah. change it. I changed it to, um, you know, made up names uh, just to make sure that no public house felt offended or slighted in any way yeah, um, yeah. by the story uh, that takes place in the book. And indeed, you know, Rebecca, of course, is a powerful uh, publishing executive, but, you know, she has her own challenges. I mean, she got embroiled in a scandal. She trusted an author with a book that um, did extremely well, but then they found out the author had lied and, you know, there were accusations. Everyone mm -hmm. is tainted, you know, the author, but also her, her, her imprint, everybody, why didn't you check it more carefully? How could you let this go into the world? And she's trying to recover from that when we meet her. Um, and I think the thing I love the most about Rebecca is that I, I really respect her. I think she is so smart and so driven and also very loving, but, you know, a little bit more smart and driven than loving when we first meet her. Um, yeah. and, and so she, you know, she's in this marriage with this high powered guy who I also love, Brandon, her husband is a prodigy of languages and a professor of Chinese at Columbia, even though he is white. Um, and, you know, what I is what I love about Rebecca is she says at the beginning, well, you know, Brandon and I, our friends call us beauty and the brains with him being the beauty and she's the brains, you know, and I just I think that's just fantastic about her. Yeah, yeah. Again, I, I, the dimensions that you provide 
around your characters. Um, you know, you, you I think as you read and you think, okay, so this is, and then as we go, we learn more about each one of them, and it's you know, and and by the end, I don't know. I mean, I'm I'm you know, I'm I'm still, I feel a little bit like, oh, that's that's you know, that's the end of the journey together, <laughs> and and you know, you just is that not the strength of an author's craft when a character is still there and you're thinking I wonder I wonder how things are now I wonder what you know they're doing now but anyway that's just a well, I, I love desire. that <laughs> Jackie I love that I mean that's what you want right you want people to read your books and to mm -hmm. feel like the characters are so alive that they feel sad at leaving them and that they want to revisit with them and say well can we not have another book about them and just hear about what happened in the intervening years in this you know how are they now can we go have coffee with them and I, that's a lovely lovely yeah. feeling yeah yeah no definitely um, now, I, if if you don't mind me asking you this question, because of course, uh, you know you provide backstory as well to the characters. So you know you you take us to rural China with Jasmine, it's great. But you also take us to a a, a New York Asian strip club, um, and and I and I wouldn't you know while well, when she's there and, and it, the choice of that location, because she could have been, you could have placed her working in any of those typical scenarios, but you went for that. Um, why that choice? Well, I excellent question again, as always, Jackie. And um, there are two reasons I chose to put Jasmine in a strip club. So Jasmine has borrowed money to come to the US. Mm -hmm. She has fled her husband. Um, she is, you know, her desire to find her child has made her break free of the shackles that always held her down. And so she borrowed money. She's in the US. She's not documented. And she is yeah. desperate to make enough money to pay them back. And she fails to find a job despite trying very hard because she doesn't really speak English. She speaks a tiny bit. Yeah. Um, and, you know, for a lot of different circumstances, she's having a lot of trouble find, making the huge amount she needs to bring them back. And Jasmine's thing is that she is really beautiful, but she has suffered terribly for her beauty. I think you know, it's the plight of women in certain situations. Mm -hmm, being mm -hmm. beautiful without power is a curse. I mean, being beautiful and having agency and being in the world, that is, of course, a great advantage and a great gift. But to have to look a certain way, but to be in a system where you have no say over what happens to mm -hmm. your body mm -hmm. and yourself. And so... Um, you know, in China, she was married off at a very young age because of the way she looked. And she has spent years trying to hide how she looks because her her husband is also jealous and controlling. And, you know, when we write a character and we create a book, we always have to confront them with their greatest weakness. The greatest issue that they need to solve um, has to be, has to be the thrust of the book because that's yeah. what they're for. That's what yeah. the book is for. The book has to force them through fire. And so because that's her issue, beauty and having suffered for it and being used and being fetishized, I needed to put her in a situation where yeah. she would be fetishized in the worst way. And she's not a stripper. She's a cocktail waitress. But still, you know, Even she kind so, of... Yeah. I absolutely. She innocently thinks that she can be a cocktail waitress and still preserve some kind of boundaries. And she soon finds out that that's not really the case. And so Jasmine, um, that is the perfect situation to force Jasmine through to confront her own issues and to grow. The other part of the second reason I chose that is because um as you may know, I was, of course, very poor as a child, but I did grow up to go to Harvard, and it was at Harvard that I decided I wanted to be a writer. So in between my degrees at Harvard and my MFA at Columbia, I worked for three years as a professional ballroom dancer in New York City. 
uh, as my day job while I was, you know, while I was trying to write and trying to learn how to write um, a novel. So during that time in the professional dance world, my roommate was also a professional dancer, professional uh, ballet and Broadway dancer. Mm -hmm. So I was really in the dance world um, pretty deeply. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you the line between the dance world and that of men's clubs in New York City is very thin. Because where do you think they get those women? You know, I mean... A lot yeah. of dancers fall prey to it because yes. they, you know, they have the body, they have the looks, they um, have the movement, and they are really, really poor. <laughs> really yes. poor. Yeah. <laughs> really yeah. Poor. So it becomes very tempting and easy to go and make a lot of money in one night, especially starting as a cocktail waitress, because you've still got, you know, you still got some clothing on, and you think, oh, it's kind of like waitressing, only it's not. So I, I knew a lot of people very well who um, fell into that world and some people came out and some people didn't. Mm -hmm. So some details about that club, I, you know, I have people read it and in the club she works at, the women's, there's no women's dressing room, despite it being staffed pretty much by women. Mm -hmm. They just have to use the women's bathroom. And one of the comments I got when the manuscript was being reviewed mm -hmm. was like, oh, that doesn't seem realistic. And I said, I know. Believe me. Yeah. <laughs> I know because I know a huge men's club in New York City that does just that. Um, so, you know, there were things like that that was great to be able to use in my writing. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense now. Again, I, I, I must confess, I had no idea about the dancing um, or, or it had gone out of my mind. So can I ask you something that has nothing to do with the writing, but I'm just intrigued in your professional ballroom dancing. Did you have a favourite dance, you know, out of all those different styles of dancing? Did you have a favourite style? I did, you know, because ballroom based. So what I what that means to be a professional ballroom dancer is I worked for a major studio and I taught, but I also did competitions with a professional partner. So in the competitions, you compete with your students, but then you do professional competitions, which are at a different level. And all dancers um, need to choose smooth or Latin. Uh, I did American style, of course. There's also international yeah. style. And smooth is the dances like um, the waltz, tango, foxtrot, where you sweep across the floors, very romantic with the ostrich feathers and so on. And Latin are the quicker, faster ones with turns like mambo, cha-cha, merengue, um, where, you know, you're, you're not moving so much across the floor in uh, counterclockwise, but you are doing more intricate dance, more in place. And, you know, I think both by personality and physicality, uh, I had, I went for Latin. I am too small. I'm only five feet tall. You cannot be five feet tall and be yeah. like win in smooth because they love those long those lines that yeah. sweep yeah. sweep across the floor. Um, that's just an unspoken reality. And secondly, I love um, I love the land dances. I I don't want to be bound to a partner like that. I like being free to do yeah, the, the, what, what the energy can do. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I love it. So I love cha cha. I love samba. I love merengue. Probably cha cha might be my favorite dance. Thank you. I mean, I know it's, like, it's not the book at all, but it's just nice to learn a little bit more. Uh, well, that's from you. my second book, Mambo in Chinatown. Ex so exactly. if anyone's interested, it's in there. It's, it's there, yeah, and, and you should. You really should. Um, I wondered about coming back to your writing craft and the notion of finding the balance of the elements. Because what I love about your work is it it sits so easily into different aspects you know so we have you know women's stories here but it's a mystery and there are thriller elements and the level of emotion that you you know you you keep us high on that and then are you aware of blending those elements or is it just as you put fingers to keyboard or pen to paper it happens what's your style you know, it, it's it's true. I mean, that's very insightful because my work is, of course, it's literary fiction. Mm -hmm. um, it's taught in schools around the world. 
but it is also hopefully a really propulsive thriller and there are elements of women's fiction and there's romance there's definitely quite a yeah, lot we of mustn't forget the romance right yeah yeah <laughs> in in the leftover women um and so you know it, it there's there are a lot of balls in the air when i'm writing mm. i think you know i do I do plan my books in advance. I've done that more and more as I've gone on from my first book. And because The Leftover Women, I hope, is a very easy, very fun and propulsive read for readers, but it has an extremely intricate architecture underneath the surface. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so you don't see it, I hope, but it has to be very intricately created in order for the timelines to work, right? In order for the twists to work, in order for every Everything to come out the way that so that it can happen that actually happened the way um it's presented in the yeah. book and so to build that architecture is something i start with you know i i start with the characters i start with an idea i start with a feeling but i also do spend time building the skeleton of the book and i can never i can never do it entirely because you know, you make assumptions about your character and then you find out later that they're completely wrong and you get to what you think is going to be a fantastic love scene and, you know, your character's like, oh, no, I'm not going to do him. And she just walks away and you think, oh, God, okay, scratch that. That is not going to be a romance. That We've got to get rid of that. Um, so, you know, sometimes they'll just rebel and go, you know, do something completely different. And then you need to restructure the whole book. You've got to break it open and re um, reform it so that it works, so that every element works together. But I do try to keep all of those things balanced. And of course I try to write beautifully. I'm trying to say something. I hope that readers, um, you know, come for the mm -hmm. kind of amazing page turning thriller, romantic read, but that they, walk away with uh, other thoughts, you know, about women, about adoption, about fetishization of yes. Asian women, about race and immigration and class. And that those are all things that, you know, are kind of working beneath the surface to make the book feel fuller and more emotional um, and more, hopefully it's the kind of book that lingers after you've read mm, it. Mm, mm. I, I really appreciate what, you, what you've said there. And in, in fact, it's great. You, you've dealt with my next question. I didn't need to ask it about, you know, what are you wanting readers to take away from this? Um, but but we've mentioned about that, that your work is is taught you know in in secondary schools and and in higher education you know in the curriculum around the globe which again you know i think to have to have you know a, a public that is not just and i shouldn't say just but not only you know novel readers but people studying the text to see what the text delivers and and that really excites me could you talk to us about the first time you were aware that, you know, that your work had been incorporated into a syllabus uh, and what that has meant for you since as an author, whether you've visited any of these sites of learning to talk about your work? Yeah, no, it was incredibly, incredibly thrilling and meaningful. I mean, I love being homework. There's nothing better yeah. than someone being forced to read your book. <laughs> no, but um, no, it, it 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 was it was it started with my debut novel, Girl in Translation, and it you know it's been absolutely thrilling. Uh, sometimes you know I get emails from kids that are like to write an essay on this like what's the answer can you tell me so that's very funny um but you know i recently for example received a video from a school in bolivia that's reading wow. my book and they you know they filmed themselves talking about what it meant to them and how much it meant to them to read uh, my work so that's amazing and people have written dissertations and theses about my work so that's thrilling. And I always do try to write books that will hold up to that level of scrutiny. Mm -hmm. So that even if, you know, uh, maybe the vast majority of readers can read it just for pleasure. And I do want it to be pleasurable read that if somebody delves deeper, that the themes work, you know, that the 
that the imagery works, that I'm not using water injury imagery to mean this, and then suddenly using it in a way that's completely contradictory or unmeant, you know, that everything I do yes. is deliberate. I mean, everything in the book from the choice of books to the metaphors to the, you know, the music that's mentioned has significance. I do nothing at random. Um, so yeah, it, it it is meaningful. And especially since I was a kid that was really saved by school yes. and by education, yes. yeah. you know, it's incredible to have people reading my work around the world. Mm. I, I, you know, I, 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 before we, we joined together to, to discuss today, I did a short bit of background reading again, um, and read about, you know, but the, the, that initial experience, uh, in, in school, uh, in America wasn't so good. Um, you know, a, a teacher who couldn't be bothered to help, you know, someone new who may not understand everything, but, but to me to sit here with you today and to see that life trajectory that that you know that I mean the success that you've had and and of course and the hard work that you have put to to be there I think it gives so much hope you know that it that, that it they, we don't need to just accept things so this is what it is my life needs to be like this my life will never change you know and I, and I don't say this in a patronizing way at all but the, the thought of okay so from this situation, you know, of being transferred to a place with, you know, different language, with no, um, you know, as you're saying, with, with lacking the basics in many ways, to being the woman that you are today, because you made choices. I think you're right. I mean, I think, of course, I've also been very lucky, but I do yeah. believe, yeah. you know, I used to think that, like, life had truths that we were meant to uncover, you know, and that they were absolute, you know, something would happen and you're supposed to figure out what, what that meant. But what I've learned is that actually we choose what we find in every event that happens to us. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can look at something like my past and say, well, you know, the poor are screwed and nothing will ever happen to, that can be better for them. And it's true. I mean, it's true that we absolutely need to improve everyone's oh, odds, yeah. Yeah. right? Especially the disadvantaged. But you can also look, you know, I looked at my past and I thought, well, this is where I came from. And it has enriched me. It has given me tools yeah. that I would never have gotten otherwise. And I'm going to use those tools to move forward in my life and in my, you know, in my career. And I I think that, you know, I, I've been fortunate to be able to do that. Not everyone is able to do that. Course, but I yeah. do think that when we face adversity, it's good to try to think, what I learn from this is going to be self-fulfilling. And if I think that I'm a person who's unlucky and gets screwed at every turn, I will be a person who's unlucky and gets screwed at every turn. Mm. And if I think I'm a person who is fortunate and is going to come through and be all right, yeah. that's what I'm going to be as well. And so that's something I've always been very conscious of. And when you and I met Jackie, you know, we at Isla Noir, I think I was there for an Agatha Christie panel. That's right. Because... You, yeah, the, the Marple collection that you contributed to, yeah. No, that's right. I mean, I was one of 12 contemporary writers asked to pen an original story um, featuring Agatha Christie's iconic character, Miss Marple, by the Agatha Christie estate. It was a tremendous, tremendous honor. I was the only um, Asian writer in that group, and I was glad to be able to use that opportunity to put Miss Marple in Hong Kong and to expose her to some Asian culture and um, to talk about that a little bit in the story while, you know, compelling, while creating hopefully a compelling, complicated little mystery around Miss Marple. Um, but so I, you know, I believe, you know, I'm so lucky to have been able to come from where I am. But a part of that is also constantly giving back and trying to lend a helping hand to others who might still be seen differently or still be not regarded um, the way they should be. You know, I, 
I speak English now and I can dress and I've done publicity, but I had many years when I was very, very awkward, very mm -hmm. awkward looking, very strange clothing and really and and you know where people looked down on me and yeah, thought yeah. i was foreign and other and i had an accent and my mother of course had an accent and i'm very aware of that and that there's so, but i was the same person inside and that there's so many people like that it's just a matter of seeing who they are on the inside mm. oh Jean, I, I, this is what I love about being with you. It's it's like, you know, all the things that we can talk about and you speak so freely and so generously about things. Uh, and, and, and thank you for that. I am aware of time. Um, so maybe just one or two questions, um, you know, just to bring our time to a close, though I know we're going to see each other at Iceland Noir again. So that makes me very happy uh, and, and we can keep talking. Um, we mentioned um, the little girl in the story, Fifi, the adopted, well, the daughter and the adopted daughter. Oh, well, we should that be only Creating Fifi, did you have fun in creating that little girl? Was was it a joy, a, a delight? Or did you struggle in to capture her? Well, it was, um, it was a real delight. Um, but, you know, you also, with a character, she, I think Fifi is like five, she turns six in the book. And you, with a character like that, of course, I have had five-year-olds myself, right? But you really do need to refresh your memory mm -hmm. about what a child like that is really is like, because it becomes very easy to create a cliche, especially a mm -hmm. little cute girl like you, is it's hard with a character like that, especially since you know she's a part of the story, but she's not one of the narrators. So it's not like she's got her own voice. Um, yes, and yeah. you don't have the pages to make her too complicated. So you want to give her depth, but very quickly and efficiently. And it's very easy to just fall into cliche and make her into a kind of you know stereotypical um little girl and i had to i really did do some research do some interviews do some observation to remember what is a five-year-old really like and they you know they're not all sunshine and roses right <laughs> they uh the things they yeah. love the things they don't love they can be very opinionated mm -hmm. um yeah bedtime you know, can be tricky <laughs> exactly exactly mm -hmm. but i did i did love writing her as a character and uh i think we can all see why you know that both moms love her so much. Yeah, I, it makes me think as well, you know, that the benefit of two moms, having one mom is great, but having two, that could just be the, the, the prospects of that, all that, all that love. No, but, but so my, my final question, um, and if it's okay to bring this in, of course, because I think it's in the publicity that you live in the Netherlands, and I, and I think we can tell from the little houses there on the on the shelf at the back there they are, and and I just I wondered, you know, from Hong Kong to New York to the Netherlands, what if anything there may be nothing but living in the Netherlands has that influenced the way that you write at all? Has it changed the way you write, or or does it bring something to the writing that elsewhere wouldn't? Oh, I think for sure. I mean, you know, I, as you said, I've basically gone through two immigration experiences yes, in my life, yeah. right? So I moved from, um, you know, Hong Kong to New York when I was a little girl. And then I moved again from New York to the Netherlands because I got married to a Dutch guy to whom I am now sadly getting divorced. But <laughs> I moved here um, years ago and had, you know, a whole other life here. Yeah. And I think it's really been extremely enriching to be in Europe um, because it's just a different way of living. It's a different way of existing. It's been kind of great in some ways to be away from all of the hype and publicity around my career. Uh -huh. um, that's okay. more in the U.S. And there's a different sensibility, um, of course, to being here. It's been lovely being so close to the U.K. as well, um, of course. And I think also that having undergone the immigration experience twice I just have a deeper perspective on yes, what it yeah. means to be a foreigner in another country and what it means to raise your kids as a foreigner um, and so on and so that has definitely informed my work.
Yeah, yeah. Do, do you know, I'm I'm thinking about all, all you've shared with us in our session. Um, of, of, of the, you know, life's path uh, or choices that people can make. And I can't help thinking that if, if your parents hadn't made that difficult decision, I wonder, would we have the beauty of your work? Because maybe your life would have gone in a different direction and you wouldn't have, you know, you know, just immersed yourself in, in in a world of literature and writing. You could have been a totally different person. And it makes me think then so out of out of maybe decisions that aren't so easy, the amazing things that can emerge. I think that's so true. And I think that if I look back at my life, sometimes the best things that have ever happened to me seemed like the worst at the moment mm -hmm. when it happened. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for example, when I first submitted the manuscript of Girl in Translation to my then agent, he dumped me and told me there was no market for the book. Um, really? And it was, oh, it was a devastating and terrible experience. And I would have given anything, anything to undo that at that moment and to have it not have happened. But then a month later, I had, you know, found a whole new agent who was incredible and powerful and believed in me as a star in a way that the other agent never did. And she took out the exact same manuscript, sold it in auction in a major deal, and it went on to become an international bestseller. So, you know, it's like it, that that's an example of when you think, oh, God, if only that hadn't happened. And I mean, sometimes it doesn't have a happy ending, right? Sometimes things can just be horrible. But sometimes you know it's what you can do with them how can you use them to grow and to change in the best way possible definitely definitely oh Jean thank you for bringing us Jasmine and Rebecca's story and um, thank you for your writing and for your you know your, your, your generosity in, in, in being with us today to talk about so many different aspects and um, from Newcastle Noir we wish you all the very best with the leftover woman and and we look forward to seeing you in December uh, at the festival. We try and make sure that, that we can bring you and so that the people who can make it to the festival get to, to enjoy more of you talking about your work. Um, yeah, I, I well, and I look forward to seeing you uh, in November in Iceland. Oh, I know, Jackie, we're going to see each other at Iceland Noir and at Newcastle Noir, yeah. so I can't wait. Yeah. And I know when we met each other the first time, you said, oh, you must come to Newcastle. And I thought, oh, absolutely, I would. For you, Jackie, I'll go anywhere. So <laughs> thank you so much for having me. Thank you. An absolute pleasure. See you soon, Jean. Bye. Take care. Bye.